Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Matt 4413 Applied Sky and Numerics Lecture 1. Um, this is going to be a little introduction with some administrative stuff, and we're going to go over the basic idea of the class. I'll be your instructor, Sarah Newman. Your TAs will be Larkon Gornak, Case Orwell, and Lexi Shung. The website um, is https uh, colon slash slash leon.edu.skya. Um, this is, after all, Nepeta Leon Memorial University, um, slash tilde s Newman slash matt4413. My email is snewman at leon.edu.skya in case you have any questions about the course. However, please answer on the course form. We'll give a link to that later uh, through the learning module. So what this course is about is applying sky and logic, um, you know, uh, in other words, class specting in slang terms to problems in mathematics and computing. So we're, the brief overview of the course is going to be we're going to do some brief history and some basic results. We're going to go over parallel computing, uh, dimensional collapse, and applications to specifically linear algebra. Um, we're going to do a little review of probability. Uh, we're going to try aspect-based Fourier transforms on event spaces. Um, we're going to move into probabilistic precognition, amortized entropy, applications of hoofding bounds, post sky and cryptography, um, specifically the fight fire with fire principle, which means that if a mind player is trying to fight you and makes puzzles, you should probably get a mind player to disable the puzzles. Um, and maybe if we have time at the end of the course, we're going to go for some more in-depth complexity theory. So what this course is not about is it's not about philosophy, seriously. If, if you're here for philosophy and you're here to debate me on, like, what aspect is, like, the best or some shit or why things are the way they are, get out. That is not the point of this course. I hate you. Um, it's not about making P equals NP through magic because magic isn't real, dumbass. Um, it's not about quantum anything, but we're going to try to touch on it. So no quantum computing, quantum supremacy. If you're a geek before the game, then you're probably a geek after the game and you're probably like, oh, is, is a mind player a quantum computer? That's... Uh, the answer is complicated. Um, it's not about anything relating to frame motifs, alchemization, or weaponry. Um, if you want to do stuff like the alchemization hash map cache overflow, you probably want to take SKN 4612 offensive maneuvers. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the alchemization hash map cache overflow is if there's a finite number of... We theorize that if there's a finite number of alchemization codes in a game, but an infinite number of items that can be alchemized, we theorize that what's actually happening is you're accessing um, items through a hash map every time you type in a code. So with careful code collisions, you can actually overload the hash map uh, of Spurb and cause some lag and mess with people. Um, if you want to do stuff like basic concept arithmetic and you know figuring out how to apply mathematics to alchemization specifically, you probably want to take SKN3310, which is cross-list with MAT3310. Uh, that's alchemization theory. Um, so before and after Spurb, we still like to do, you know we like to do math. Um, it's kind of a part of human culture, troll culture, um, many cultures in paradox space, um, probably even the blood brine. Who knows? Um, in scarcity economies, math is done for survival and acquiring surplus, and it's also done for fun. In post-scarcity economies, we don't really need to survive or acquire surplus because we're all immortal, so math is just done for fun. And it's even more fun with the tools at your disposal post-game. So there are a few major advances in no particular order. So first, there's dimensional collapse, which is theorized by every nerd during the game. Um, oh, if I give n answers to a problem and n timelines, then one of them has to be correct. Um, so there's this joke called the quantum bogo sort joke, which is where you, you know, say, oh yeah, I can sort any list in one step. All I have to do is just split the universe into all the universes where there are many permutations of this list, and then just pick the universe with a sorted list, and then destroy all the other universes. Bam, one step. Um, this is a stupid thing to do, and it's a stupid way to die if you actually try it, so don't. Um, there are more clever ways to actually do dimensional collapse. We're going to get to this at the end of the lecture. Um, the second thing that really happened during the Thronebound incident was the Steve Akiyama precognitive mechanism, which uses an afflatus type power to compute a problem directly. However, this relies on an aspect conduit, which is a kind of a euphemism for trapping somebody's soul in a sword. Um, and it relies on ac aspect conduits for efficiency, so it's generally frowned upon. Uh, this would be considered a war crime if the Geneva Convention still existed, but it doesn't, so it's just considered a very unfortunate thing to do. Please don't try it. 
Um, what really what we really use now is loaned entropy, which is kind of like an adjustment to classical probabilistic algorithms. You get, you know, most obviously a mind player, a light player, but we can get other aspects to work on it. It's basically a weighted random number generator with the weights being the right answer at a cost. So it's like a probabilistic algorithm, except you get the right answer sooner rather than later. And this is how our paradox compute cluster works. So the major applications to this are that aspect acceleration on most modern OS schedules. Schedulers speeds up execution by 1.41 times. So pre-spur people wish they had our technology. Um, this means that alchemy computation fine tuning finally has rigorous backings. So that means that you can create new, I mean, we get more into this in the alchemization course, but um, we can create items more efficiently and more specifically. Um, Netcode scaling to cross-universe communication, like massive multiplayer online games. Um, you know, under normal networks, you can't handle a game with billions or trillions of players, including all your dead timelines. But um, here, you actually can. And of course, yes, you can kill people with it, but we're not going to get into the weaponry aspect. So the basic principle is that an oracle is a program that solves a given problem correctly in a single operation. So in computing, we usually use oracles as a kind of tool to say, you know, if I had this and it could solve my problem, then what other problems could I solve here? Um, so there are various models of computing, such as probabilistic computing, which is classical computing, plus you get an extra ability. You get the ability to generate a random number. Uh, quantum computing is kind of like a step above that classical computing, but you can put multiple quantum states in superposition. So you can have you can control your distributions with quantum states. Um, they can also have negative probabilities um, and complex probabilities, but we're not going to get into it. And then you can observe the system, which collapses it to a state. And finally, which is us, we have Sky Numerics, which is a classical computing plus the clever use of oracles. If you ask your aspect a question, then you can probably solve an answer quicker. Um, we also find out what counts as an oracle, what questions are valid for an aspect in any given circumstance. So here's an administrative interlude. So the prerequisites to this course are Coast 4100 numerical methods, which is cross-listed as MAP4100 and also SKN 1500, which is Sky and Logic. Uh, you're expected to have a background in real analysis and the basics of numer numerical linear algebra. Uh, you're also expected to have played SPURB, so if you failed your game, please leave the course. Um, you should be comfortable with Linux, Daedalus, or Grub Kernel or equivalent environment. If you're a human, you may be familiar with Linux. Uh, if you're a troll, you may be familiar with Grub Kernel. Daedalus is kind of this, um, it's, it's kind of new in paradox space terms, and it tries to emulate the classic computer system, but incorporating aspect-based acceleration from the base instead of as a modification to the kernel on top. Uh, you should be... <coughs> Sorry, this is why class is held over PesterZoom, a uh, subsidiary of PesterChum today. Um, it's because I'm sick. So you should be able to learn, able or willing to learn Carrot Cake, which is a programming language commonly used for stuff like this. There's no textbook. Class is available on the course. Class notes are available on the course website. Um, the assignment policy is that assignments will be due in relative time after they're assigned. So that means that once you get the assignment handed to you, you will have a week of your time to do it. It doesn't mean that you can time travel back a week and reset your timer. It's relative time. So. Um, that does count. We enforce this with various mechanisms. Assignments are worth 40% of your grade, uh, midterm and final are 30% each. Um, we enforce it with carbon dating aspect detection, just in case you try to mess with the carbon dating and the relative time verification software on your university laptop. Um, you may not discuss the code with of your assignments with your classmates. Collaboration on ideas is expected and encouraged, however. Uh, however, here's the exception. You may not make your relative past selves or other people's past selves aware of your solutions in any manner. Um, the relative time verification software is installed on your university laptop, so we will catch you if you try to cheat. So all st enrolled students have access to our Paradox Compute cluster, which is how you'll be able to compute all the um, assignments for this course, which will rely on aspect-based powers. However, you don't have the power of all 12 aspects or whatever. So we'll be using volunteer labor to do it for you. This is upheld by volunteer effort. You may have contributed for credit, so don't be stupid. Um, 
you can use the Sky and Compute interface link or skill backwards compatible with SSH. Uh, so first you would type in SSH and then your um, username at gateway.leon.edu.skya for the PCC gateway. And then from there, once you're connected to the gateway, um, you should type in skill and then the aspect server. So mind, hope, breath, blood, heart, doom. Uh, that should auto resolve to the server with the given powers that you're looking for. So if you're having a skill issue, please contact us and we'll help you with your skill issue. Sorry, yes, yes, Azura. Retcon-based abilities are kind of rare. Um, if you retcon, then you have bigger problems than your assignment. Um, generally, we can detect it as in it would obviously create an offshoot meta timeline. However, your meta timeline is entirely separate from ours, and it would not matter. So you would effectively be erasing yourself from the timeline. Um, and you would be out of sync with the class and potentially the entirety of Paradox space. So we should, um, so you would have bigger problems. You would have much bigger problems. So here's a refresher on big O notation. So f of n, a function, is we call it O g of n if and only if there exists a constant c and a constant n0 such that for all n, bigger than n0, this dotted line, f of n is less than or equal to, f of n, this is purple line, is less than or equal to a constant times um, g of n. So what we're usually asking here is given an input with n elements about how many steps will the algorithm take. So if your input has n elements and your algorithm takes n squared steps about, or two n squared or a million n squared, as long as it's constant in front, then you would call the algorithm O of n squared in time complexity. So the basics of parallel computing is that you're doing multiple things at once. So parallel, the word parallel usually applies SIMD, which is single instruction, multiple data. So you're doing one instruction on many pieces of data. So a basic example is a sum a list of numbers together. So the normal algorithm is you take the first one, then you add it to the second, then you add it to the third, and then you get to the end of the list, and that takes O of n operations because there are n numbers in a list, and in order to add them, you obviously have to see them all and then add them all. However, the parallel algorithm is you add each two adjacent elements together, and then you add those two together, and that all takes one time step. However, since you have you know many cores, you can add you know half the list to half the list and then cut the size of the list in half, and then another step, you do it again and again, and again, and this takes O log two of N, log two of N operations. Uh, this is possible because each quote unquote row of operations is being done at the same time. Uh, obviously, if you were doing this with a classical computer that could only do one operation at a time, it would still be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, you know, 15 times uh, O of N. It would take 15 steps. However, here we can do it in four with a parallel computer. That's good enough. Uh, a better example is sorting. Um, so the normal theoretical bound is O of n log n. The parallel bound is O log n given infinite processors. Uh, normally we wouldn't have infinite processors, but uh, this is spurb, and we can kind of use some other tricks to simulate infinite processors. Um, Amdahl's law is the overall performance improvement gained by optimizing a single part of the system is limited by the fraction of time that the improved part is actually used. So in other words, when you're using an algorithm and 95% of it is parallelizable and 5% isn't, the parallelizable part can be sped up infinitely. Everything else can't. So you can cut that 95% down to zero and it, you could speed it up 20 times because you would only have to do the 5%, the non-parallelizable part um, in the given number of steps. However, can we do better? Uh, not really, but we do have tricks. So for speeding up non-parallelizable sections, we have oracle construction and speeding up parallelizable sections. This gets into our first trick that we will discuss, dimensional collapse. So the dimensional collapse, um, you should not do this. If I can give n answers and n dimensions, don't try to create extra timelines just to solve your problem. Um, it won't work. You will die of exhaustion. Um, and also you will be killing millions, uh, if not billions, of your alternate selves. Don't try it. Um, 
So for real, uh, say you have two n by n size matrices you want to multiply. So the classical algorithm is each space requires n multiplications because each space you're multiplying the elements of a row and a column together. Um, so that's one, two, three for three by three matrices. So each space requires three multiplications. There are three squared spaces. So that's n times n squared equals n cubed. So it's gonna be about n cubed operations. There are better algorithms outside the scope of this course, but there are none better than n squared. So the parallel algorithms are you perform every space's multiplication at once with an individual thread. So that's O of n squared steps in real time. Uh, with infinite cores, you could technically perform every multiplication at once, leaving only the sums with O log of n steps in real time. So what you could do is you could try you know, the early so basically, if you don't have a parallel processor at your disposal, you could try these collapse mechanisms um, also if the parallel processors aren't good enough. So the early and most basic is you have a time plate or do it themselves with doomed selves. This is generally frowned upon. Um, you could use time travel, which is less efficient but less dangerous. So the general rule here is the number of copies multiplied by time spent for each copy, because if you do something for 10 seconds and it requires two people and you time travel back, uh, to the beginning to do it for 10 seconds again you just spent 20 seconds you wasted 20 seconds it's not like oh it's only 10 seconds no for you in relative time it's 20. Um, that's why we usually like to do um, that's why we usually like to do this with non-sentient organisms like you know computers um, a computer's not an organism, sorry. Uh, just just non-sentient things. Uh, we usually like to make computers that can time travel uh, and cooperate with themselves rather than actual time players doing it by hand. Uh, you can also do it with mind precognition, which lets you go down multiple timelines and light dimensionality, which lets you foresee multiple timelines and the result of a given problem in multiple timelines if you're careful enough. Uh, you can also use light dimensionality reduction, which is kind of like a Fourier transform on the event space. Uh, we will discuss it later um, in the course, uh, probably about in five classes. Um, for non-parallelizable things, we have oracle construction, the non-parallel analog of dimensional collapse. Uh, certain problems can effectively be solved on site with aspect questioning. Um, usually this is computationally simple, um, so it's less than O of n. Um, so if you're asking your aspect a question um, and you're saying, if you're asking your aspect a question, um, the problem is, uh, Aspect questioning is unreliable as to the problems it actually solves. However, we have a theory that uh, the effort and the chance of success of actually executing an aspect question, uh, such as in a flattest type ability, it depends on the size of the input. So that means that the size of the input should be about a thousand, maybe a million, if you're willing to uh, accumulate paradox. Um, so this is the main principle rather than the actual time the algorithm would take. Uh, so that means that theoretically you could solve a very small traveling salesman problem, um, which is very hard. Uh, it, you can't do it in polynomial time. It would actually take exponential time. So it would take something like two to the n. Um, so this is based on the heavy lifting principle from SPURB theory, which means that um, SPURB doesn't actually care about how hard the problem is or how long it would take. It only cares about its weird conception of how hard the problem appears to be and how much you would have to struggle to solve it. So that means that if a really easy problem was really important, um, it would weigh this relative importance and it would um, require more aspect power from you, which is why you probably, we have more efficient methods to do this if you're working on something actually important. Uh, if you're working on something for fun, um, this doesn't really apply because the aspect power only works for stuff that is quote unquote narratively relevant. So the theoretical model is there's an instantaneous computer, uh, let's just call it Skya. Skya executes code and it stops when it gets to, I don't know, a million operations. Uh, this is the theoretical model. So that means it doesn't actually care how long the algorithm would take or how many operate, or it doesn't care about how many, how long the algorithm would take. It only cares about how many operations it does. You can do a problem with a thousand operations and a million operations in the same time. Um, however, you would need to draw more power. So that recall, so recall that adding a list of numbers together takes log n operations with infinite cores. Uh, we can see this on slide 12. Um, 
So the simplest oracle construction is, oh, mind, light, doom, whatever. Can I add this list of numbers together? And if your aspect is in a cheeky bastard and says yes or no, um, it will give you the answer. So given proper knowledge and access to all numbers, this is an 01 operation. That means you can do it in constant time, which is just asking a question. So together with dimensional collapse, if you know how to multiply numbers instantly and add numbers instantly, matrix multiplication, you can add two you can multiply two matrices together in a single step, which is crazy. Uh, there are a few caveats, which are these techniques generally only work for polynomial time reductions. You cannot solve the traveling salesman problem instantly, so P does not equal NP. I'm sorry. Um, there's the usual aspect power drawbacks, which is that you might get a made-up answer if it quote-unquote works well enough. Um, there's paradox accumulation, and this can be offset by amortized entropy. And the most efficient algorithms come at the significant risk of the user. Uh, I forgot to make the slide on amortized entropy, but it means that if you make a calculation, uh, you can actually... It's kind of like a less harmful version of paradox accumulation. Um, so paradox accumulation means that if you use a power, you start to fade into your aspect. Uh, however, you can offset that by just getting a wrong answer on a bunch of less important stuff later, uh, which is why usually we let you volunteer to run the paradox compute cluster for credit. Um, it's upheld by volunteer effort. Um, you may have contributed for credit in your freshman year, um, we usually say, oh yeah, if you operate the cluster, it will come at a couple drawbacks that are very that are very temporary to your personal health and your aspect powers. However, uh, we'll let you graduate sooner. So, you know, thank you to the volunteers of the PCC for running it. Uh, this will be the end of class one.